Joining us today are Brent Insko of Intel, Brad Grantham of Lunar Jib, Jakob Bonacrantz of Calabra, Robert Blinkensop of Ultraleap, Sam Robinson of Holochip, Steve Winston of Holochip, Sam Morales of Holochip. And with that, I'll turn the helm over to Brent Insko and we'll get started. Brent? Thanks, Jeff. And thanks to all of you for joining us for OpenXR's first webinar. As Jeff mentioned, my name is Brent Insko, and I'm the OpenXR Working Group Chair and Lead XR Architect at Intel. Today I'll talk about what OpenXR is, the problems we're trying to solve with it, and the latest developments with OpenXR. What is OpenXR? OpenXR is a royalty-free open standard providing high-performance access to AR and VR platforms and devices. Throughout this talk, we will refer to these platforms that support either AR or VR or both as XR platforms. OpenXR handles communication to and from an application and an XR platform or device. An XR platform provides the application information such as the head and hand position, information about the controller or input state such as whether a button has been pressed or released, also display configuration and form factor information such as whether there is a single display or multiple displays. The application provides the XR device or platform an image or images to display, audio, also haptic responses such as vibrational response in controllers. So what problems are we trying to solve with OpenXR? Consider just a few of the XR platforms available. With the AR and VR markets still relatively small, an application developer will want to target as many platforms as possible. But with each of these platforms potentially providing separate proprietary interfaces, it becomes a daunting challenge to support a wider and wider collection of platforms. Before OpenXR, an application developer would have to program to each platform's proprietary API. This becomes a daunting challenge as you support more platforms, both from a development perspective and a validation and testing perspective. OpenXR enables application developers to program to a single common high-performance API, which then provides support across a number of different AR and VR platforms. OpenXR contains everything an application needs to drive XR devices in a system, including device discovery, event processing, sensor tracking and pose calculations on the input side, and frame display timing and composition, plus haptics control on the output side. OpenXR is used alongside a rendering API such as Vulkan to generate the imagery. OpenXR can be used with any 3D API, but a new generation API such as Vulkan is particularly well suited to create applications with high rendering performance and a low latency that are so vital for creating a compelling XR experience. This slide shows the structure of an OpenXR application. It's just an example just to kind of give a flow of how an application would work. Uh, we don't have time to get into it here, but I encourage you to take a look at our GitHub repositories uh, we'll also be discussing some additional sources of sample code later in the presentation. 
This webinar is to give an update on OpenXR, but I do want to take a step back for a second and look at the timeline. We formed the working group in early 2017. We released a provisional specification at GDC in March of 2019, followed shortly thereafter by a ratified 1.0 OpenXR release at SIGGRAPH in July. We gave a one-year update this July where we officially launched the adopters program and open sourced the conformance test suite on GitHub. We had a number of conformant implementations available, as well as a number of developer preview implementations. And we released hand and eye tracking extensions, one of which we'll talk about a bit later in the webinar. So now let's talk about what's happened since July. Just last week, Unity announced their planned support for OpenXR on their partner platforms by the end of the year with additional experimental support for all conformant OpenXR runtimes early next year. Also announced last week, the Blender Foundation, the organization behind Blender, the free and open source 3D creation suite, joined Kronos. This gives them the ability to help shape the future of all the Kronos APIs, including OpenXR, Vulkan, GLTF, and many others. We also have two new conformant implementations, the Oculus Quest 2 and the HTC Vive Cosmos. So giving a quick implementation status update, we have currently conformant implementations from Microsoft on the HoloLens 2 and the Windows Mixed Reality headsets, the Oculus Rift S and Quest and Quest 2, and the HTC Vive Cosmos. We also have developer preview implementations from Valve with their Steam VR, from Vario and Collabro's Monado, which Jacob will talk about in a moment. We now have the first wave of conformant OpenXR 1.0 devices. These devices have passed a suite of conformance tests developed by Kronos to ensure that XR platforms conform to the OpenXR 1.0 specification. This suite of tests is available open source on GitHub for use in developing and prototyping OpenXR implementations. Companies using the conformance suite are encouraged to contribute test fixes and enhancements to the suite. In order to publicly state OpenXR support, use the OpenXR logo and gain the patent protection under the Kronos IP framework, companies developing XR platforms must become an OpenXR adopter and submit their conformance suite test results to the OpenXR working group. Once an official adopter and the test results are approved, Kronos grants trademark and patent licenses. It's important to note that application developers are free to use the OpenXR API and its logo. To demonstrate OpenXR's flexibility, one only needs to look at the initial set of conformant OpenXR devices. We have both all-in-ones and PC tethered devices covered. We have AR and VR devices covered. We also have devices covering both Android and Windows. By the end of the year, OpenXR will have wide game and rendering engine support. Unreal Engine has supported OpenXR since last year and has recently released improvements to performance and mixed reality capture. Blender has supported OpenXR since June and its 2.83 release using OpenXR for VR scene inspection. And as mentioned earlier, Unity will support partner platforms by the end of the year with early experimental support for component 1.0 runtimes early next year. It's still early days for full game support of OpenXR, but Microsoft has announced that Minecraft's new Render Dragon rendering engine will build its desktop VR support using OpenXR. OpenXR has been integrated into the open source Chromium browser project. And as of Chromium release 81, 
uses OpenXR as its default backend for WebXR support. This enables Google Chrome and Microsoft Edge browsers to use any OpenXR compatible hardware. So in summary, I covered what OpenXR is, why we developed OpenXR and the problems we were trying to solve. And I also talked about what the latest developments are with OpenXR over the last few months. OpenXR has widespread industry support. It's a collaborative design integrating a lot of the lessons from the first generation proprietary XR APIs developed across a number of vendor platforms to create a new generation API with cutting edge capabilities and a flexible, extensible, future-proof architecture. I think the reason that OpenXR is gaining such wide industry adoption is that it's a win-win for all involved. Software developers or ISVs win because they can write an application once and ship on multiple hardware platforms without reporting, both saving time and money and reaching a much larger audience. XR hardware vendors win if they expose the OpenXR APIs on their platform as they have access to a much larger library of OpenXR compatible applications. And most importantly, end users win as they will know that the XR applications that they want to run will be compatible with the system they have purchased, growing confidence and the XR market for everyone. Now is the time to get involved with OpenX. Cronus has open sourced the conformance tests and launched the OpenXR adopters program. We have officially conformant runtimes from Microsoft Oculus and HTC with preview implementations from Valve, Vario, and Collabra. Collabra, we'll talk about theirs in a second. Hand and eye tracking cross vendor extensions for advanced UI and extension for overlays, which Brad will talk about shortly. And OpenXR is starting to be used by real software from Unreal to Blender to Chrome, Edge, and Unity and Minecraft coming shortly. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Brad Grantham from Lunar G. Take a second to bring up the slides. Oh. Thanks, Brent. Um, like you said, my name is Brad and I work for Lunar G. Um, we uh, are responsible partially for the initial implementation of the OpenXR loader and the validation layers. And another claim to fame for Lunar G is the Vulkan SDK. But I'm here to talk to you about overlays. <clears throat> um, and by overlays, what I mean is uh, content provided by an additional program that's overlaid on top of the main VR application that you're running. Um, Existing XR APIs already support this notion. Uh, one example is IVR overlay in uh, Steam VR. And if, out, if a, a second application can add content to a primary application, it enables uh, a wide variety of use cases, including bringing your desktop OS windows into the world in 3D, viewing an in-game HUD like a tachometer on a uh, racing game in your car, uh, a virtual keyboard, and uh, Pluto VR produces a uh, chat program called Pluto, which provides um, avatars in world for you to, to view. Uh, next slide, please. And here's an example of Pluto, uh, the 3D chat program. On the left hand, you can see a uh, 3D avatar. This is a um, the, the entry room in a headset, and on top of that, the Pluto app is overlaying its content, which includes this avatar and also its menu, which you can see here. On the right side is a video stream from an iPad, including depth, which is overlaid on a, uh, which is overlaid on another application. And a key thing here is that these applications, the, the um, entry room and this space light app don't know anything about Pluto. Uh, Pluto is adding its content separately. Next slide. Thank you. So to bring this capability to OpenXR, 
the working group introduced the overlay experimental extension to OpenXR 1.08. This is already supported by collaborators, uh, Monado Runtime on Linux, and uh, I'll tell you more about other possibilities for Windows and subsequent slides. Um, what this means is it's an experimental overlay uh, extension. That's what the X means in X to X. And we're providing this extension to prove the concept and work through issues that we discover as we implement this. Uh, we encourage feedback. <clears throat> Some things that need refinement include security, access control, and input focus. And we hope that when those issues are resolved and we get a pretty good consensus that open XR runtimes in the future will incorporate a refinement of this extension. So for Windows and Drake3D at this time, Lunar G under sponsorship from Pluto VR are producing an open source implementation of an API layer that provides this extension, as well as a sample test app that can be run with unmodified OpenXR apps. If you've looked in the SDK for OpenXR, you may have seen a program called Hello XR, which is kind of the OpenXR version of the traditional Hello World program. And using this API layer, you can run Hello XR unmodified with this layer loaded and then a separate sample program loaded and it inserts its content over top of Hello XR. This is all programmer art to be sure, but it shows the capability of the system. So at, at this time, the layer only supports uh, Windows and Direct 3D, but other graphics APIs are in the works and we're gonna be going forward trying to show the layer more sunlight, get it hardened, more uh, reliable and robust and also package it for deployment with apps so we can start seeing it in the field and uh, get more feedback. So this is a little bit of a technical diagram and I'll try and go over the, the, the top level of it. Um, on the one hand, you can see on the left, uh, a VR, a regular app, um, like a Beat Saber app, connects with the OpenXR loader, which then in this case with the API layer loads our DLL. And in, in ordinary operation, the DLL just gets out of the way and just transmits your OpenXR commands directly to the runtime. But if an overlay app connects, then our DLL also does uh, initialization directly to the runtime. And once overlay XR sessions are created, the API layer communicates all of that state back to the main app where its commands are interleaved with the main app's commands. So I think what, what I'm trying to show with this slide is um, that the, the, the API layer that we provide is essentially a series of hooks between the OpenXR loader and the runtime. And it's transparent to the main app and provides this overlay functionality uh, without having to do much except load it. Next slide. So here's a quick snapshot. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to give anybody the idea that this is a, a physics app with collaborative chat. This is really just the test program, which is a flip book, uh, a couple of images that animate back and forth on top of the Hello XR program, which is the colorful cubes. But it shows that the system, it shows that the extension works and you can download and run this today. Next slide, please. It's available on GitHub. You can download and build it now. I recommend uh, if you're an advanced user, giving it a try. Um, if you're interested in overlay apps provide and developing apps that add content to other primary apps. Uh, if you try it, please report any bugs or issues to us. And if you have any questions, drop us an email and let us know what you found. Again, thanks to Pluto VR for sponsoring the work. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Jakob from Calabra. Hello, uh, my name is Jacob von Krantz. Uh, I'm XR Tech Lead at uh, Collabra. Uh, Collabra is a open source consultancy firm uh, and we do mostly embedded stuff uh, or um, pretty much only Linuxy things, uh, but also some Android stuff. Um, so, and also my contacts there. Please, next slide. Um, so just a little quick, overview of, of what Monado is. Uh, it's an open XR runtime. 
it's the thing that basically sits between the application and the hardware. Uh, so drivers and all sorts of things like that. Uh, it is fully open source. Uh, so anybody can take it, build it, uh, modify it, and in a way it's a, and has a really permissive license. It was started by Collabra as a project um, since we wanted to go into XR, um, but it's also made by the community. So we want to build a whole community around uh, Monado. Uh, yeah, and next slide, please. So this is just some quick links uh, to Monado if you want to try it out. Uh, download it. It currently only supports Linux um, or and <laughs> uh, some very experimental support for Android. But yeah, uh, just feel free to look at those uh, links uh, when you have some more time. Next slide, please. So I will uh, be talking a little bit about these topics like passing performance and some notes about overlays and our Android support. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we are currently fully passing conformance uh, using a simulated device. Um, yeah, uh, we we haven't submitted the, the conformance uh, the conf conformance results uh, because the you are kind of expected to do that on a device and we'll sort of have a whole product and collaborate as a software firm. We're not really a hardware firm, so we don't really sell our own hardware. So we sort of skip, <laughs> we haven't done that just because of that. So, but if you, you know, if anybody wants to make a product based on that, that wants to have a, conf uh, a conformant OpenXR implementation on there, they can use Monado either working with us or doing it themselves in order to get that. So um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, open, and, sorry, Monado supports the uh, overlay extension that uh, Brad talked about. Uh, it is native inside of Monado. So that is just something that Monado does by itself. Uh, we don't, you don't need an extra application, an extra layer to be inserted. Uh, so any application that is running on um, you know, Monado uh, can use that functionality if they want to. Uh, it's also on by default. So yeah, it's just there. Uh, yeah. Next slide, please. So I will show a quick little demo. Again, warning programming out. Uh, so this is the Hello XR application running first. And then I'm running my own application on top of that. Uh, and layers and even another applica application. And then I'm shutting down two of them applications. And that's basically <laughs> it. Just, just a very quick demo to show that, you know, we can stack multiple applications on top of each other. And uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, so the, the big news today is that Monado has uh, Android support. We were hoping to have it upstream <laughs> Uh, today, but we didn't quite make it. So we're hoping sometime next week to actually merge all the patches that are needed. So you can download Monado, um, load it up in, great, uh, in Android Studio and build an APK that will install uh, Monado into it. And we are also working along with other members of the working group and non mentioned, non forgotten, uh, to create a universal Android loader. So you're, you would add that to your application. Um, and it would, uh, you know, you can then your application, that APK would work on any Android device that supports OpenXR in the future. So you can, so you don't actually have to build special APKs for each and every device. Um, we are starting with cardboard, yes, because that's every, basically everybody has it. Um, so you can sort of try it out. Uh, and again, we don't have our own devices at search. So we're just making sure that it works on Android uh, and having you know, some default uh, drivers for Cardboard or even Daydream sometime in the future. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the demo of that. So I'm going to start 
Hello XOR. Uh, and this is running on the device that I'm, that I'm using screen copy to show it. So little Hello XOR. Uh, I'm just clicking it through and then our, our Lubosch, uh, one of our engineers ported his own XR application over here as well. So both of them working. Um, thank you so much for um, listening to me. Uh, I will hand it off to Sam Morales, Sam Robinson, and Steve Winston from Holoship. Holoship is developing developer resources for OpenXR utilizing Vulkan. Uh, we will show some OpenXR demos that uh, also use DirectX and OpenGL. However, we're predominantly looking at Vulkan because we want to be able to show you things like uh, ray tracing and some next generation displays, uh, such as light fields and uh, real time design surrounding how to make a uh, OpenXR application that works in both a headset form and a light field form or cave like form. Um, we expect the audience here to be basically people who are uh, interested in learning about how to use OpenXR. And uh, we um, will expect you to have already set up a, a working OpenXR runtime to follow along with these demos um, and to uh, be able to uh, see how things are going. So with that said, let's get to it. We started out with one of Sasha Williams' Vulcan demos. And we look what, what it would take to uh, add OpenXR to it and make it work uh, specifically for either OpenXR or Vulkan. Um, so GLFW is used in place of the uh, windowing uh, code that uh, Sasha Williams has in his demos. In order to handle a much higher level of windowing code, we're just going to abstract that away. Now, the OpenXR stuff, anytime you see this Boolean flag, you know you're going to get uh, OpenXR uh, code versus uh, Vulkan code uh, directly. Um, and uh, the important point to make here is that uh, there's not really a whole lot that you have to do different in order to enable uh, the Vulkan mode of OpenXR. There is one catch, though, however. Um, that's this legacy OpenXR flag here. Uh, very often in our code base, you'll see that uh, there's a change between using legacy OpenXR uh, or non-legacy OpenXR. And what that means is that uh, the Vulkan original version of Vulkan Enable uh, for OpenXR uh, made it so that the Vulkan uh, instance had to be created by the uh, application developer. Um, this doesn't work all that well with uh, some of the more later stuff that we need to be able to handle. And uh, the working group recently uh, made the change to Vulkan Enable 2, wherein the runtime itself uh, for OpenXR handles the creation and um, uh, management of the Vulkan uh, instance. Um, so in order to handle that, uh, there's a Boolean flag here. Now, diving right in, um, once we have the renderer all set up and everything, this will work for all of our demos that we're planning on doing. Um, we come here into Particle Fire. This is the specific demo that we chose. You'll notice that in Particle Fire itself, uh, we're very careful to not actually utilize anything that is OpenXR compliant. Um, everything here is very close to what uh, Sasha Williams wrote in his very first iteration. Uh, we did make a few changes in order to reduce the number of warnings, as you can see on the right hand side here. There just aren't really any warnings left. Um, and uh, we do handle the GLTF just as uh, Sasha Williams does. Uh, and we cleaned up a little bit of that code as well. Um, but uh, on the whole, everything here is very similar to uh, the Vulkan code, and it actually works both ways. It's either a Vulkan or a OpenXR application. Um, so how does that work? Well, this is our OpenXR class, and the OpenXR class itself handles all of the uh, OpenXR stuff that uh, it will uh, be required to uh, utilize in the lifecycle of an application. And then that is controlled by the Vulkan Util class. Uh, it's a super class. Um, 
And uh, here's where uh, the OpenXR util is uh, created. And as it is a member variable, it is also destroyed. So it is within the lifecycle of a uh, Vulkan util that this uh, uh, class is utilized and the uh, OpenXR stuff is uh, created and destroyed. Now, taking a look at what the uh, application actually does, um, I want you to pay particularly close attention to the waveguide uh, capabilities of the Loomis headset that is uh, being displayed right now. Um, as you can see, uh, the colors are very bright, and this is actually a camera that's looking through the uh, headset. Um, so you're getting exactly what you would see in real life, if not a little bit of a um, uh, lesser amount of uh, uh, light coming in because the camera itself is uh, not as good as a human eyeball. Um, so uh, as you can see here, uh, we have very strong uh, lighting from uh, the fire and the frame rate is pretty high. Uh, if we come back to the uh, OpenXR application, let's see what happens when we run the exact same thing with uh, Vulkan enabled instead of uh, OpenXR. Uh, so we'll just uh, do that and let it run. There you go. In order to get access to our uh, samples, if you go to the holochip.com website and then navigate to OpenXR, uh, you will find our demo framework is uh, prominently displayed. Just click on that and you're able to get access to uh, where our Git repo is and uh, information about what uh, dependencies are required to be set up, um, along with uh, resources for OpenXR in order to uh, get help from uh, all sources uh, from Kronos. If you need any additional information, please contact us at info at holochip.com. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to uh, Sam and uh, let him talk about uh, how we're going to use uh, SLAM and um, make localization a uh, much more appealing thing for uh, our OpenXR runtime offering. What you guys are seeing right now is a video demonstration of Orb Slam 3 with the map viewer on the left and a pass-through uh, viewer on the right using the Mint S camera with an embedded IMU. Uh, Orb Slam 3 is a fairly new algorithm. It was released. It's 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 built upon uh, Orb Slam 4 and Orb Slam 2. Uh, the biggest the biggest things. Um, well, the biggest takeaways being that the way that it allows for IMU integration, which lowers computational cost, which is really good for preserving any kind of battery that you um, or battery life in one of your headsets or or any of the devices that you're going to be using uh, SLAM with. Um, it's also different in the in the way that that keyframes are 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 selected. Um, that instead of comparing in, instead of comparing in space with uh, with all sorts of different keyframes, uh, depending on the algorithm that you're using, or like three distant keyframes. It actually uses neighboring keyframes so that uh, with potentially overlapping feature points, this allows for faster uh, acquisition of the and selection of the keyframe, which again lowers that computational cost. Uh, when when this is again, this is a very basic uh, implementation of it. Um, the the biggest issues that I had was actually the calibration. Uh, with the YAML file, uh, it's it, it is since it is tightly coupled with the IMUs, um, any kind of error or deviation in the in the YAML file or the calibration will result in in not being able to track correctly or uh, distortion issues, things along those lines. So that is one of the big things that that um, that we that we've been trying to correct uh, uh, with this with this implementation. Um, uh, one real, really neat feature that 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 occurred during this was when we did like kind of like a non-controlled drift test where we we just kind of stood still and kind of moved the laptop and camera around. We noticed that that there was there was not very much drift at all, which is really good and obviously something that we wanna we wanna go for. Um, uh, in future development, um, we want to we want to eliminate. We obviously we want to try to eliminate as much as much drift as as possible. 
um, as well as as uh, establishing a little bit uh, or establishing a, a better protocol for the calibration so that that way it doesn't um, uh, have tracking issues, which you kind of see that it has right there. You saw the path that I took and then now you can see the actual map. Um, that was some errors that I had with the with the actual uh, I, IMU calibration uh, and synchronization. Um, we are going to be using. Uh, we think we're going to be using this uh, Orb Slam three as our as our Slam algorithm. Obviously, uh, when we when uh, in our in our Holochip runtime, um, it'll be a more fully tested, robust, and polished version of, of what's going on right now, um, and that is that is currently in the works. All right, now I'm passing over to Sam Robinson to talk about Holochip's developer resources and services. The resources will cover the basics of setting up an OpenXR development environment, including the OpenXR SDK, runtime, device stack driver, and sample application. It'll also cover modifying runtime functionality, such as the SLAM implementation and creating OpenXR extensions. In addition to maintaining developer resources, Holochip provides OpenXR consulting services, such as setup of development environments, runtime modifications, customizations and extensions, and application development, optimization, and compliance testing. Holochip's team includes skilled engineers who have led the development of multiple AAA game titles and built core technology used in commercial XR headsets. We offer general OpenXR training for beginners, intermediate, and advanced developers. The OpenXR runtime consists of eight parts, each of which govern a different aspect of, of its functionality. And while Holochip's team has development expertise in all eight parts, most of our R&D efforts are focused in two, spaces and rendering. The spaces part enables the runtime to map the environment around the user and enables applications to interact with that environment. Holochip is actively developing SLAM implementations, data structures, and custom sensor hardware to optimize this environmental understanding. The rendering part provides the application with a rendering context, which is correctly configured for the attached XR device. Holochip is working on several custom systems which use Vulkan to create custom render context for specialized headsets, such as those with multiple displays per eye or integrated light field displays. We have several projects currently ongoing, and they are customizations, modifications, and extensions of the OpenXR runtime. Many of these features will soon be available to the public. Hello, uh, I'm Rob Blinksop from Ultraleap, where we specialize in mid-air haptics and optical hand tracking solutions. And I'll be giving a quick overview of the OpenXR hand tracking extension and some of the considerations that went into its design. Uh, next slide, please. So the hand tracking extension, uh, which was introduced in OpenXR 1.0.9, is a multi-vendor extension uh, that enables applications to render fully articulated hands in XR experiences and use these virtual hands for natural interactions in XR. Now, this is a major milestone as all major hand tracking solutions in the XR market are on board with the same standard in OpenXR. And it includes support for a wide range of hand tracking technologies, such as optical hand tracking from Ultraleap, Oculus, Magic Leap, and Microsoft HoloLens, as well as controller-based hand tracking, such as Valve Index and Oculus Touch. Next slide, please. Now, the API itself is designed to return 26 unique hand joints for each hand, uh, returned as a fixed sized array of these joint locations, which can be updated every frame without any memory allocation. Now, this is also designed into a consistent coordinate space for the left and right hand, using the same right up back conventions as OpenXR, defined for when the user's hands are in front of them. Now, importantly, runtimes that implement this extension make a number of guarantees about tracking validity, uh, including ensuring that all joints in the hand are either valid or invalid, uh, and that every joint will always be present, even if it can be actively tracked by the system or not which means that the underlying runtime will infer or interpolate those missing points. Now, this is really important as it means that apps don't have to have their own logic for dealing with missing tracking data in scenarios where part of the hand is occluded uh, and can always be designed to assume that if a hand's tracked, it will have the complete picture. Oh, thank you. Um, so the video here, the user can raise their hands and you can see that they're actively tracked by the system as he performs a number of different poses and gestures. 
they can also reach out and naturally interact with objects in the scene uh, as they would with their real hands. Now we'll enable some joint visualization quickly. And you can see that each of the individual joints of the hand are being actively tracked but all at the same time, even when the hands start to occlude each other and the tracking system may not be able to see the other points as they're inferred by the runtime. Now, this demo is uh, part of the StereoKit test library, uh, which is built on top of OpenXR and the hand tracking extension. And this particular example is running with an UltraLeap tracker attached to a Windows Mixed Reality headset. Next slide, please. So looking at the hand structure a little bit closer, the first challenge was really agreeing on that set of joints that all vendors uh, can provide. Um, and there was a number of variations, mainly in the wrist and metacarpal area. But in the end, all vendors are signed up to the same 26 joints, uh, with everyone providing the data for those joints, no matter the underlying technology that their system was based on. So if they could only track fingers, the rest of the points have to be inferred to implement this extension. Now, it was decided to use the joint locations in the hand rather than the bones to avoid any assumption of the bone hierarchy that might come from that tracking technology as well. Now, the names for each of the fingers were carefully chosen to be culturally neutral with the thumb, index, middle, ring, and little, and using the medical names for bones. So the tip, distal, intermediate, proximal, and metacarpal, along with a palm and wrist joint. And for each of these, we can retrieve the radius for visualizing the hand without a 3D rigged model and optional velocity data. And the group agreed that any other joints could be exposed with additional extensions down the line, such as our forearms. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, moving on to look at both hands, there was lots of different conventions in coordinate spaces. Um, we considered using the standard TBOS, which is used for human body model rigging, but this has a mirrored coordinate space between the left and right hand, which means that logic would need to be aware of which hand it was operating on um, and in terms of doing transforms and meant that code cannot be completely hand agnostic. So in the end, we selected a consistent space for both hands using the right up back convention when the hands are in front of you and each joint orientation is aligned to the bone that it is named after with the tip and uh, distal bone being parallel to one another. <laughs> uh, the third challenge was um, looking at the calling pattern to use to retrieve the joints. Now, the working group looked at some of the existing patterns in OpenXR, such as the XR locate space function, which is used for reference spaces, and the action binding system family of functions. Then um, we decided, however, that that wasn't optimal uh, or were overly complex for retrieving hand data. Um, and so instead, we opted for a single XR locate hand joints function which allows all joints to be retrieved at the same time, which is the most common scenario with hand ricking and avoids maintaining large amounts of handles to separate joints that have to be queried independently. Next slide, thank you. <laughs> Not everything that is possible uh, is addressed in this first release. Um, that we're looking at options to extend with the ability to track different joints, either in this extension or optional extra extensions. Uh, hand meshing is quite an important consideration, especially when you look at the AR space, when you want your real hand to visually acute your virtual scene. Uh, and Microsoft has a vendor specific extension, which already demonstrates this on HoloLens. Also interest in looking at high level hand inputs, such as key hand shape recognition or key poses and gestures, as well as a standardized way of determining measures like finger curl for applications. There's also interest in looking at the controller simulated hand tracking systems, such as controllers being able to report what poses they're capable of producing if they can't accurately track the hand in real time. Next slide, please. Um, but in summary, the hand tracking extension is, is there, it's published and it can be used today. Um, there's much more information that can be found in the OpenXR specification on Kronos.org. Um, and if you're looking for samples, the Microsoft OpenXR Mixed Reality samples and the StereoKit repositories are both available on GitHub and both utilize the hand tracking extension. Uh, Ultraleap, we have also released an API layer which adds support for the hand tracking extension on top of existing Windows runtimes. Um, and these enable you to use them with an Ultraleap controller, even if the underlying runtime doesn't support it. Thanks for listening. Uh, we look forward to seeing what exciting applications everyone implements with hand tracking and natural hand interactions. And I think now we're on to the Q&A. Okay. Thanks, Rob.
So I will do my best to moderate the Q&A. Thanks to all the panelists for the presentations. That was great. Uh, I would encourage the attendees to submit your questions to the uh, using the Q&A feature of Zoom, and we'll try to get to all of them in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, so let's start off with probably the um, uh, more uh, one of the interesting ones, um, you know, and what you know this was related to in terms of talking about what the latest developments are in OpenXR. You know, what are the most important next planned developments for OpenXR submitted by Marcus? Um, so in general, Kronos doesn't give a lot of details about what we're working on next because that tends to give us into a lot of trouble when we don't deliver or we decide other features become more important. Um, but I can kind of give an over, overview of, of some of the things we're thinking about. Um, obviously, after releasing 1.0 and as we get more and more applications and platforms using and getting experience with OpenXR, um, there are going to be things that we're going to want to fix <laughs> from 1.0 um, that we didn't either get in or we're realizing after the fact that, oh, wow, we'd really wish we had done things a bit differently. Um, there are some things around frame timing um, that we're looking at, uh, trying to make it easier for developers to do um, correctly using OpenXR. So there may be some things there. Um, uh, overlays, which Brad talked about, uh, is also a high, highly rated one. Currently, it's an experimental extension. We'd like to see that uh, get across more platforms, more devices, get more experience with it, and, and pull it closer. Um, either a multi-vendor extension, maybe a KHR extension, which means more platforms support it. Uh, and then as with other Kronos APIs, um, that's generally the way you make forward progress. You start as an extension and then eventually they get rolled into core features of a future uh, you know, dot revision of, of the specification. Um, we also wanna do and add more VR support, sorry, AR support uh, features. So scene understanding, geometry detection are some areas we're looking at. Um, and most of these features, as I said, we, we won't have had a lot of experience with them. So they'll probably uh, be added in as extensions, such as the hand tracking and eye gaze uh, tracking extensions, get some experience with it, and then roll it into to core going forward. Um, and kind of one of the other ones that, um, there are other things that, that didn't make the 1.0 cut, um, something like third person views, uh, better mixed reality capture support, I think is, is on the list as well. I also see we have uh, several questions around caves. So are there plans to support non HMD VR systems such as large multi-display systems um, in caves in the near future? So Steve, I think uh, you have some experience in this area. You wanna to start that question then we can give Jacob and some others a chance to answer. Sure, so uh, we are working on um, everything from uh, tabletop uh, light fields uh, to full cave uh, uh, and enclosure style uh, systems. Um, so uh, yes, there's there's definitely work around this, um, uh, but it's not available yet. These are one of the things we are working on. Um, and uh, a lot of the problems that currently exist with uh, being able to render uh, to a light field and to multiple displays like that, uh, external displays are some of the things we are looking into uh, with the working group as well. And Jakob, do you yeah. want to go ahead? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, we're definitely interested in and like we're all, uh, at least me and Steve are definitely cave fanboys. Uh, so we're very much uh, into that. And there's also like other uses that are not just headsets. Um, the problem is you also need to be able to communicate. You not also need to have specialized content for it, not just in rendering, but also in how you interact with, with them. Um, so how you interact with a light field space can be quite different from how you interact with the normal one. So those are things that we need to think about as well. So the, the, it isn't just render more views, it's a whole bunch of other stuff as well. Yeah, there. I would say that that cave systems, and we we had this. If you've seen early presentations on OpenXR, is definitely a, a feature that we, we were considering. It's just for 1.0, we had to cut some things, and and for efficiency's sake, uh, things get cut. 
Um, so, but yeah, it's definitely on on the list of things to be considered and, and expand support beyond just uh, either single screen phone type form factors or uh, left and right eye, you know, head worn displays. So let's uh, talk about, um, there's a question about the device layer plugin interface. So I'll start uh, a bit of an answer and then give uh, Rob a chance to, to talk about Ultra Leap's experience. So as many of you know, if you've, you've tracked OpenXR for a while, you know, there were two parts. There was the application layer interface and a device plugin layer where it would allow other devices to plug into um, another company's runtime. So as, as we developed OpenXR 1.0 um, and got more experience with what we would want to, to be able to control from a vendor perspective, um, you know, one of the major things we wanted to enable was input device uh, additions and making it simpler to have, you know, a variety of different input controllers. And we think we've got a, a fairly robust input uh, system to, and that would allow, you know, various vendors to um, add in their own custom input devices. Um, and then we, we feel like most everything else, the platform would really want to, to control to enable um, better performance and, and better, um, uh, just user experience. Um, and I would say, you know, not all of the major vendors, you know, have conformant platforms or conformant OpenXR runtimes yet, but I would say there are additional vendors out there that are currently working on their own OpenXR um, platform and runtime. So, um, so watch for those. But I would say also, if your company is interested in the device layer plugin, please join Kronos and you can help influence us to, to try to make uh, and, and pick that back up. Um, and then Rob, do you wanna give a, a chance to, to talk about your experience extending uh, OpenXR without using the, the plugin interface? Sure. So uh, at Ultraleap, we were obviously looking at, interested in adding our tracking support on top of existing headsets in the market without building an entire separate runtime uh, to support this. And the API layer functionality that we've talked about today uh, on this and the overlay is actually really powerful um, and enables you to sit in between the OpenXR runtime and effectively intercept any call and modify that with additional information or change its behavior. Uh, and doing this, we're able to intercept and add support for an additional extension, in this case, the hand tracking one, uh, but also then provide all of the actual data outside of that using the extension functions, but also overriding the behavior in the runtime to add support down the normal actual lightning paths or any other part of the API. So uh, the system has been very flexible. Um, we really didn't need anything more from a device API in this particular example, um, and the API layer enabled us to do everything that we wanted. Okay, great. Thanks, Rob. So let's, uh, we've had several questions on overlays. So Brad, uh, if you want to start in on one of those um, or questions, feel free. Potentially the ones, uh, applications to be able to interact with each other, or are they running in separate environments? Maybe start with that one. Sure. Um, and I think uh, that this has two meanings for me. One is, um, can they interact programmatically? Can they send messages to each other? Um, I think that's probably not what this question meant, but um, you, you, there's no current a, uh, API in OpenXR for applications to communicate with each other, um, but that's something we can look into. Um, another meaning for this question is, uh, are they able to interact in 3D? Can they get lighting information? Can they get geometry information? And again, I don't think that we currently have any API in OpenXR for that, but it's something that we've discussed. Um, lighting in particular and being able to communicate back and forth uh, whether input is secure or not, those kinds of things are, are on the table. Okay, um, and yeah. uh, I was just gonna say, uh, let's jump to the depth compositing one with overlays um, from Nova and Jacob, did you wanna start with that? And then Brad can do uh, a follow-up. Sure, yeah, we are definitely looking into that. Um, it's, it's one of the things that's kind of hard to also conform as test because you have to actually look at it uh, and also what does depth mean for say cube maps or uh, quad layers or things like that. So um, yeah, and we all, yeah. So just getting everything semantically correct across all vendors that would implement it and if all vendors actually can implement it. Um, 
is, is the problem there. But yeah, we will, we will definitely want to do that. And even for layers that the application has submitted just for itself, we also want to. Um, yeah. Okay. And then Brad, you want to follow up on the depth compositing? Um, as quickly as I can say, the opening source specification says that compositing of these layers is, for anyone who hasn't read it in detail, is essentially just back to front. Um, and so that's what the question comes out of. Uh, overlays are the same, so you don't really get uh, depth like objects interpenetrating, um, uh, which is really great for visual cues. So that's what you want. So um, yeah, we've, we've discussed this at, at length. Yeah. Uh, and to also a bit about interaction with each other. Um, just being, that's something that might come with once we start adding interactions with the world in general. Uh, so either you would have a VR application that's pretending to be the real world and send information up to the other application, that only application that is actually an AR application, uh, or yeah, they can get information uh, via that way uh, between each other. So that that's but that's definitely something further out than just simple depth <laughs> depth. Uh, comparison because that's something we, we know how to do. Um, but like, yeah, the other stuff is a lot of thinking needs to be done to uh, be yeah, good. OK, thanks, Jacob. Um, let's see, another question. Um, does or how, how are user data privacy concerns handled? Is that above this level? So we have had discussions about uh, privacy and security. Um, we do work with protected content and, and, and making sure that that, that works. But um, beyond that, the, the varied ways the platforms that OpenXR is trying to span and how those platforms handle privacy and enabling, you know, microphone, the camera, eye tracking, et cetera, is, is a really daunting challenge. And at least at this point, we're, we're letting each of the platforms uh, kind of handle it themselves, but we are looking at, you know, how do you enable permissions and, and, and things to things like overlays to allow multiple applications to talk to each other and what data can you pass back and forth? Um, yeah, go ahead, it's, it's also hard because the only tool we uh, OpenXR has to enforce anything is via the API and you can you know, you can have a function, don't leak my user data, but the application can just say, I don't do it and then do it anyway. So there's nothing we can really test uh, in that way. Uh, so yeah, it, it's hard <laughs> that way. Yep. Uh, another question on WebXR support being available in Chrome and Edge. Does WebXR have the same feature set as OpenXR? Are there any WebXR demos using the latest API publicly available? So I, I don't know all of the details around WebXR. I do know that we have several members of OpenXR that are also on the WebXR uh, committee in the W3C. Uh, and we are trying to stay very closely aligned. I believe we also have an liaison agreement between Kronos and the W3C to make sure we're staying very closely aligned. So as things get developed in one API or the other, um, we are making sure that that support is in the other uh, API as well. So that you're bringing all of the ability of doing um, AR and VR natively on your device or platform. We're trying to, to make sure that WebXR can deliver that via the web and in browsers as well. Anyone else wanna to add to that? I don't think we have our WebXR guys on currently, but. Okay, uh, and then the other question, uh, guidance for correct usage of overlay. Brad, do you wanna take this one? Does headlocked content cause nausea? Um, I don't think we have a lot of uh, guidance um, for, for correct usage in terms of uh, nausea, in terms of the user experience of uh, um, whether it's moving correctly in the scene. Um, my experience has been that um, a headlocked content, as long as you have a lot of other scenery that gives you um, a reference is not a big deal. Um, I, I do want to point out that that overlay in the use that's uh, in this question is just like a 2D rec that's stuck wherever your head turns, it moves with you. But um, the term that we use in the extension is pretty much any layer. So it could be in the world, it could be headlocked, 
um, it's pretty much up, up to the application, like how they position it and what it's what reference space it's in. Um, so it's uh, a really good question. Um, my background is not really in user experience for motion. So if anyone else has an idea about that, they can pipe up. Um, yeah, in general, OpenXR is more aimed towards what the runtimes have to do and you know, imposing a strict conformance to behavior so that all application works the same. Um, but we also want to build a good ecosystem around OpenXR. So we are working on um, you know, re developer resources for applications and uh, you know, best practices and stuff like that. Uh, I think Microsoft has some really good guides and some really good documentation on OpenXR on their Windows Mixed Reality page. Uh, and I'm pretty sure there are uh, you know, best practices there. But if there isn't that something you know that we are lacking and we should be and also lacking and we should be expand and also point more towards so app, app developers uh, are served as well. <laughs>